So should you consider buying an ID3 instead of your next Golf? Hello guys and welcome to this Volks Wizard video, which with no exaggeration is probably one of the most important videos I'm ever going to make because it's about one of the most important cars I'm ever going to film, the brand new Volkswagen ID3. This is the golf sized full electric vehicle from Volkswagen that symbolizes a new era for the company. And I've been given 24 hours access to it by the cool guys at Inchcape Volkswagen Cheltenham. Now in that time, I want to find out if it really is the car you should give up your golf for, because that's a question a lot of Volkswagen owners will be asking. So without any further ado, let's have a closer look at Volkswagen's ID3. Okay, let's start off then by talking batteries and charging. Being a first edition car, we have the mid-range battery pack here. That's 58 kilowatt hours, and that gives you 260 miles WLTP combined range. That actually goes up if you just use it in the city to 358 miles. So because it's just so efficient doing slow speeds and a lot of coasting and regenerative braking, when you get it on the open road, obviously it uses a bit more energy. There's a lot more drag, but around town, that's 358 miles on one charge. Now beneath that, which will probably be ample for many people, there'll be a 45 kilowatt hour battery. That's 205 miles combined. So obviously more if you use it in the urban environment. And then in the future, probably more for longer users, longer journey users. There's a 77 kilowatt hour. that's got a range of 340. Now, if you use a fast charger, you can get 180 miles range. That's pretty much what I do commuting in a week in just 30 minutes that's pretty cool if you use a wall box it takes about 10 hours so significantly longer but that's still an overnight charge for most people or even a day at work well it is for me now let's have a look at the charging so there's no funny charging sockets hidden behind badges it is where you'd expect the petrol filler to be it's only on the one side so when the car's unlocked it opens just like a petrol flat apart from it's got this waterproof inner here to keep all the electrics sealed and then this is a standard, I think, seven kilowatt hour charger. So you just take that and put that in there. And then you should get that going green when it's happy. So that's it. Now to release this, you can't do it. Even though the car's open, you still need to press the unlock button on the key. So yeah, even though it's the key this car, the unlock button has a purpose. It will be glad to know. Okay, so press that. And now we can do that. And then that just slots back in there. Like that. That's pretty simple, really. So yeah, the big deal with the ID3 is that the range is now so high that for most people's needs, one charge could last them quite easily a week, quite often longer. Okay, now it's time to have a look at the outside of the ID3. And there is a lot to see. So let's start off with the colour. It's called Machina Turquoise Metallic. It's a £620 option. And I'm so glad my car today is in this colour because it's the signature colour for the ID3. It's been in a lot of the marketing for the car. It's a bit like Deep Blue and R32s. And whilst you can spec it in blacks and greys, you're kind of missing the point really because this is a bold statement of a car from Volkswagen and it needs a bold colour. Now with that £620 for the paint this car stood here now is £39,500 with no extra options it's just the paint everything else is standard you get £3,000 off with the government plug-in car grant for, so it's £36,500 is what you'd need to pay to own this car today right let's have a closer look at it then so first off let's talk about the size of it so today's my first day seeing an ID3 in the metal well properly in the metal I did have a quick look at one in the rain and first thing I'm noticing is how big it is. So it makes that T-Rock over there look pretty small, to be perfectly honest. There's a Golf 8 over there. It's bigger than the Golf in every dimension. It's wider, it's taller, it's longer. But the biggest difference is in the wheelbase. Because this is a car designed to be electric, so there's no wasted space at the front here, the passenger compartment is maximised and batteries are low down in the car as well. So it's a really good use of space. It is a bit like the TARDIS. You can tell how big it is externally though by the wheels. These are 19s, got 21550 19 tyres on them and they don't look overly big. But I think it's probably 
not too much difference to drive than a Golf. You've got sensors front and back as well, and it is really easy to manoeuvre, as we'll talk about later. But yeah, it's not a small car. Some people may struggle to put it in their garage. Okay, so being a first edition, we've got this badge on the wing. We've also got these silver mirror casings, we've got a black roof and this black inlay here as well. So there's a lot of contrast. At the back, we've got a black tailgate, a bit like an up, but unlike the up, this is not glass. So you have a separate window and this is like a composite or a plastic or something, which means that the actual molding of it is nice and true. It's not all wonky like the rear of an up. These decals are part of the first edition spec and unfortunately you can't not have them, but you can obviously remove them if you want to. At the front, it looks just like a modern up. If we could have a new up, please, looking like this, but smaller, maybe with electric powertrain, that would be pretty nice, yeah. We've got the new Volkswagen badge, which looks good. It's like got a white bit instead of silver, which looks really sort of modern and cool. Front bumper's pretty normal. There's not an awful lot down here, not much cooling needed. So yeah, it's got these sort of hexagon shapes in it to brighten it up a bit. Yeah, but overall, from a design perspective, it's not going to put people off because it's not a particularly revolutionary design. It just looks like a Golf might do in, you know, maybe next generation, really. If they completely revised Golf 8, if it looked like this, I wouldn't be at all surprised. OK, let's now have a look inside the ID3. But before we do that, it's got a little trick I want to show you. Normally on keyless cars, you have to touch the door handle to unlock them. On the ID3, when you're within a certain range, which is probably there, it unlocks by itself, which is a nice touch. You still have to pull the door handle, which seems oh, so labor intensive after all that. Okay, there we have the cabin. Now, other colors will be available. This car is white and various shades of gray. Maybe not for everybody's taste, but it makes the cabin feel very spacious and airy and relaxing. And that's on top of the fact that it is a spacious and airy cabin. It's a big cabin. It's like the TARDIS in here, thanks to the clever use of space. Now let's start with the door card. So we've got a light grey padded bit for your elbow there, which is just as well if you like to drive with your elbow there, then that's quite hard. We've got a white bit here with the controls set into it. So we've got mirror heating, but we've only got electric switches for the front, unless you press this button there, and then they can be used for the rear. So you can't use them at the same time, but whether that's cost cutting or clever use of tech, I'll let you Decide. I don't really normally get excited about door bin plastic, but this textured bit here is really nice. A little touch, but it looks really cool. We haven't, unfortunately, got the flocked door bins all the way up, which is a Golf trademark, but there's a bit of flocking down there. While we're down here, let's have a look at the pedals, because the Germans have a sense of humour, yeah? We have the pause button on the brake, and we have the play button on the throttle, yeah? That's just funny. British sense of humour, yeah? Well, that's because you can drive this car really with just one pedal because you can use regenerative braking to slow the car down. So you actually probably never need to use the brake. Um, so yeah, it's it's a very clever car, which we'll come to when we do the driving thing. Seat bases look very golf-like. All the runners and all this is very familiar. Fabric's a bit different. It's like a, a fade there from dark grey to light grey. A bit of sort of fake Alcantara around there and a bit of pleather actually on the headrest with contrast piping. So quite a complicated seat I guess when it comes to you know cost of manufacturing all these different fabrics so yeah it does look reasonably expensive white steering wheels well I know how long that will last with me but maybe with all this hand sanitizing it'll last a bit longer now than it would have done a few months ago let's have a look at the dashboard then so we have various shades of grey And the steering wheel, okay, that's, is very familiar. It's got controls for cruise and for audio and stuff like that on there. That's pretty much where the similarity with the Golf stops. So firstly, have you ever sat in a car and you've adjusted the steering wheel and the seat and you can't see bits of the instrument cluster? Well, fear no more because the instrument cluster is attached to the steering column, which I do actually quite like, particularly in the up. I can't get comfortable without missing some important thing off the instrument cluster that's good while we're on it this bit also has attached 
the shifter of a gear selector is not really an awful lot to it. You can select drive or regenerative braking by doing that. Neutral is a little click in the middle and reverse is like that. So if you're maneuvering, it really is second nature to just flick around with that. It's much easier than moving your hand down here where there is nothing. We have bottle holder, cup holder, phone holder, blimey, week shopping holder down there. The benefits from not having a traditional architecture. This is the MEB architecture coming out. And there's also a little storage net there for smaller stuff like um, cards. A glove box, yeah, just press that. So the button's actually on the body releasing a catch. So yeah, it's um, not a bad bit of plastic that actually. This is all, yeah, it's hard, but it's got a nice texture to it. It's not shiny. It's all right. The vents, they don't really have the lovely damping of Golf 8, but they're all right. And we've got a first badge on there to brighten it up. No sunglasses holder. Yeah, it's cool. It's a bit weird having the, the lighting switch here because it's sort of hidden by the steering wheel, partly by the instrument cluster, but you shouldn't need to use it much. So basically it's auto lights or you're going to put your fog lights on or you're going to demist. So I guess in the UK we're going to demist a lot, but yeah, it's not it's got the prominence it would have done on a car in the past. Funny little armrest attached to the seats, a bit like being on a plane or a train. Obviously we've got the buttonless dashboard, so uh, you haven't got heat, climate controls separate, they're all in here. But honestly, you will get used to them. That is really easy to use, it's just like Golf 8. So shortcut to climate. You've got a heated steering wheel as well, which I've never seen on the Volkswagen. So that might be handy. You've got heated seats as well. They all use power though, so you have to use them carefully. Let's just turn it off. To get to the main interface, you press the home button and then you've got all the other bits and pieces just like golf. So should we have a flick around? Let's have a look in vehicle. Okay, so there's gonna be loads and loads of charging info here. So we've got 96% I think left of the range, we've got 226 miles there, the car's done 171, that's all, so it's a very, very new car this, but there's no running in to do because it's an electric motor, I think the tyres are probably okay at 171. Comfort lights, yeah, that's sort of puddle lights I suppose, stuff like that. What can we do with the headlights? Dynamic light assist, dynamic cornering lights, automatic headlight control in rain so it comes on when it's raining, uh, four clicks on the indicator with convenience, so it's all programmable. Just have a look at charging again. Yeah, auto release the cable, that's an interesting one. Data. Okay, so it's, it's too new to have an awful lot of data recorded in there. It's, right, let's try, what else can we play with? Background, so we've got ambient lighting. Maybe because it's not dark, it's not working. Back to the home button, got more screens here. So yeah, you'll get used to that. I've not used this car before and I don't find it too offensive. Just give it time. But yeah, first impressions are pretty good. Apparently, the wipers operate the wrong way around now, so let's turn it on. What would you normally do? So which of the wipers are on this side, so. Oh yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So normally you go up the stalk on a Volkswagen to get them going faster. On this one, you go down. Yeah, well, that's an interesting change that really didn't need to be done, but that could just be to just make this car stand out from the Golf. Okay, let's have a look in the back then. So yeah, plenty of room in the front. It's in my driving position there, which is, I'm six foot. And let's get in the back. Okay, so I've got some reasonable knee room. There's loads of room between the seats as well. So that's, that really does give you 
feeling of space because you can see right to the front of the car, no problems. So that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be quite happy to be a passenger in here. But, you know, I've got to say, it does all look pretty good. I'm not sure if there's some trickery going on, but just texturing this there looks great. And the light just sits on it differently because it's not flat. Still hard plastic, but it looks good. OK, and then let's now have a look in the boot, which apparently is a little bit bigger than that of the Golf, and the Golf one's pretty big for most people. So it's opened with the VW badge, and it goes up by itself to some degree. OK, I've got a load of crap in here, but you can see it's a big boot. Yeah. If I can lift this up, maybe I can show you what's underneath it. So there's no sort of handle. It's just a cut, cut out bit there to lift it up, which is a bit cheap. But so there's no spare wheel. And there's not even any tire foam in this car. Whether that's right, I'm not sure. But yeah, it's a good size boot. You can, of course, move the seats forward very easily. Like so, it's just a traditional car in that respect. And we have got Isofix as well on both rears. That one's been deployed there already and USB-C just down there, map storage at the back, and like Golf 8, phone storage there as well. I thought you might appreciate comparing the ID3 to the Golf 8. Obviously, they're a completely different design, but size-wise, you can kind of get a feel how they compare. There's not a massive difference, to be honest. So if you look at the width, it's probably hard to tell because the ID3 is a lot bulkier at the front because it's got a shorter bonnet, and that bonnet's made to look even shorter by the black inlay at the back of it, but even so, it is significantly shorter from the bottom of the A-pillar to the front than the Golf, as you can see here. So the Golf looks like it's got a really long bonnet in comparison, like a, like a big luxury saloon car. So they're roughly lined up at the front and at the back. You can see the length isn't massively different on the ID3, so they're there or thereabouts. Height-wise, yeah, there's probably a little bit more glass house in the ID3, which gives it the extra height. It's also got a humongous spoiler on the back of it, which is purely for aerodynamics. That's the big difference with this car. It's been honed to be aerodynamic, which gives it greater efficiency and therefore a greater range, which could be the difference between getting home and not getting home. And also to my eyes, the design, because it's clean design from the ground up, is a little bit more cohesive than that on the Golf, which has a front that doesn't seem to match the rest of it, particularly in this non-sporty model. So there you go, guys. Is it the ID3 or is it the Golf? I'll let you guys decide. Okay, guys, I don't know about you, but I'm really curious to see what's under here because basically it's a big battery on the floor and some motors driving the back wheels. There's no engine or anything. So let's quickly have a look under there. What I'm surprised about is that the release is actually on the correct side because there's no real reason for that. You don't need to go under the bonnet that often. And yet they've put it on the correct side. They haven't left it on the left-hand side like they do on a lot of cars. The first thing you notice is that the bonnet is quite far back where it opens. And then also it's smaller than you think because this, this black bit's almost over the um, sc scuttle. So this section is actually really only the bit that you can see into. We'll try and open that again now. Okay, so yeah, we have an airbox for the cabin there. We have some coolant, I'm not sure what that's for, maybe it's transmission related. A brake fluid master cylinder reservoir there. Screen wash there. No telescopic struts, guys, really sorry about that. Um, battery there. Down there, we have some steering gear, so we have a universal joint. And I don't know what that is, that's a cooler of some sort there. So, yeah. Not an engine bay. Jeez, what do we call that now then? It's not a bonnet, I suppose it's got a bonnet, but it's, yeah. Let's call it the bay. So, when it comes to practicality, it would appear to be at least as practical as a Golf. But I think it's now time to see if it will drive at least as well as the Golf. So, 
without any further ado, let's go and drive the Volkswagen ID3. Well guys, I'm going to remember this moment for a very, very long time. My first drive in a Volkswagen ID3. There's been no car as significant for Volkswagen during my uh, driving career, which is 25 years. So yeah, it's a really big thing this. The first thing we need to do is talk about range because currently we've got 229 miles showing and I need to get to work. I'm in Cheltenham now. We'll use Waze as an independent adjudicator to distance. So if I say go now, it says 46 miles. That means we should have 183 miles left when we get back there. So let's see how accurate that is because this is the big hurdle electric vehicles need to overcome. The charging infrastructure is one thing that's getting better. Volkswagen have partnered with Ionity and yeah, it's getting better slowly. But believable range is the first obstacle. So there's only one way to find out. We'll also do some driving impressions while we're at it. So I'm comfortable now. I actually brought my seat forward from when I was in the back of the car. That wasn't my driving position. That was my filming position. So there's a lot more room in the back than there was in that bit. Now to start it, we, I think if you press the brake and do that, it started so we're in drive now it tells us we're in drive with that noise and there's no parking brake i've only just noticed that so not only the gear selector up there there's nothing down here which is cool there's no noise now it just says ready and it's on auto hold so it's holding the car on the brake all i need to do is press play <laughs> and there we go you can hear the springs there's something to do with the, sus the suspension compressing there over a bit of a bump, quietly edge our way onto the road. It's always a bit weird driving electric cars. So this is a modern car, which means it's got a pre-programmed noise built into it, which you can actually hear inside the cabin. And it sounds, if you've been on a train, electric train, they make some funny noises when they're accelerating and decelerating. It's a bit like that. So all I need to do now is brake want to need to brake indicate which is the right way up still and you can put it into regenerative braking mode which means that basically you don't need to brake so if you click that again in the direction of drive it switches to B on the cluster and that means that the car slows down really heavily without you touching the brake so let's try that again this is 28 miles an hour and now 19 and all the time it's doing that it's harvesting energy which goes back into the battery and increases your range so yeah you do need to make that click to get the most out of this car in every other respect i don't feel like i'm doing anything particularly revolutionary no it's easy foot off the brake onto the throttle we're off there's no clutch to worry about so it's lovely and smooth Surprisingly, we've got a button for driving modes as well. I didn't really expect that, but if you press that, it's just like Golf 7. We've got Eco, Comfort, Sports, and Individual. In Individual, you can mix and match, and I didn't know this was standard, but it's obviously got switchable dampers because the chassis can be Comfort, which is in now, or Sport. Steering, Drive, which is, I guess, throttle response, adaptive cruise control. The lights can be changed as well. Light assistance and air conditioning can all be configured to how you want it but yeah I was really surprised that we can make the chassis a little bit harder as well so let's just give that a try it's, it's quite well rounded now but it's firm even in comfort mode really there's a lot of weight to manage in sport yeah yeah it's a little bit more affected by uh, imperfections in the road surface but it's still not too bad okay let's see what it can do on this tricky slip road at junction 10 of the M5. So we've got regen braking for us. Yeah, it feels pretty composed. Mm, my neck muscles are breaking it. Yeah, tidy. That's pretty tidy. You can definitely feel there's not a lot of weight in the nose. Can we get in front of this lorry? Yeah, loads of grunt there. So we're doing 70 miles an hour now. 
and let's press set on the cruise So range is currently 209, so we needed to be 173 when I got back. I did put the aircon on initially, but I've turned it off again now, so I can just do that in Klima. Yeah, it's definitely no aircon on. It's just controlling the temperature at 21 without using aircon. It's roughly about, that's probably a bit less than that ambient, so I'm not, I don't need the aircon on as such. So I'm not a big fan of using aircon when you don't need to, because even in a petrol car, you feel the effects on fuel consumption in an electric car it could be the difference between getting to your destination and not so of course use it if you're warm because staying fresh when driving mentally is having good air is crucial for that but if it's not a warm day don't bother okay guys i've made it to work and the bad news is for a 43 mile journey the range has gone down 54 miles so it was about 25 percent inaccurate which is a bit disappointing but i want to give it another go i've got to go home later so we'll give it a go then i don't really understand how this can estimate that very accurately anyway because it doesn't know where i'm going or how i'm going to do it or at what speed i'm going to do it i'm going to do it on a motorway i'm going to do it on an a or a b road where it'd be a little bit more efficient where there's less drag and more regenerative braking it's a bit of a weird one and also if you go up a lot of hills yeah you get regen on the way down but it's still more efficient to drive on the flat so mm, they've got a lot to learn there i think because Okay, fuel gauges may not be accurate and they adapt to your driving and if you drive hard, suddenly it'll come down, but you just put more fuel in. You have to really calibrate this in a way that's a lot less optimistic for people to have faith in the range. But like I said, we'll give it another go. So let's do another little test now. Let's do another range test. So we're gonna be a bit more accurate this time. I'm gonna to go to Cafe in the Machine and put this car in front of people, see what they think of it. I'm going to reset the trip now to zero. It's 164 on their range, so we can just compare directly what the car is saying. It's not a cold day today either, by the way. It's probably in when the sun comes out, quite warm. So it's a favourable day. We've got no aircon on. We're definitely in eco mode. And I'm going to drive sensibly um, to the speed limits, like, of course, I always do. So. Let's see how we get on. I'm not going to narrate this one. I'll just get us to CNM and we can talk about the range when we get there. OK, guys, well, we made it to Caffeine in Machine and the good news is the car appears to have redeemed itself. It's only used 16 miles of range. We started with 164 and it says 23.7 miles have been covered. That's going from Alvechurch to Ettington near Stratford up on Avon. So that's pretty much made up for the nine miles lost on the motorway run. I think the moral of the story is that if you're going to use an ID3 on the motorway, you need to allow a fair bit more range than you actually think you're going to use because it's not a particularly efficient car at, at motorway speeds. But if you're off the motorway, 60 mile an hour roads, basically where in, internal combustion cars are more efficient anyway, you'll find it, it easily matches the range or beats it. So yeah, it's um, an interesting one, but I'm glad it redeemed itself because really this is a big problem for me. I've got range anxiety today because my battery on my phone is dying. My GoPro battery is dying. My radio mic battery is dying. I can't even use the USB-C charging points in this car. But luckily there's a 12 watt volt one in the boot, which should help me charge my phone up. Anyway, so yeah, no real problems with range, but if you're gonna use it on the motorway, be extra careful with how much you allow until you get to know the car really well okay guys well here we are on a british b road in the id3 now you could say this bit of the test is irrelevant but i say it's very relevant because if you own a golf you may not even know it but it's one of the best handling cars in its class you may just sense it you may just feel that reassurance on a wet motorway slip road and so on and i think if you're going to change to an id3 you don't want to lose that because golf 4 was pretty terrible and ever since then, golfs have been great. Is this platform going to be good or bad for handling? Well, the only way to find out, here's a, a British B-Road bend. So let's tip the car in now. And it feels really darty and agile. The steering's very sort of vague, but the front end is lovely because there's no weight there. It's just air and all the weight low down where the battery pack is. We're in regen mode, 
with the braking, which means it slows down a bit when you come off the gas. There are no gears, you just squeeze it and it goes, and it does go. This is not a slow car. So what mode are we in? Easy enough to change it. We're in sport, so it's probably a token gesture to dynamism, but let's just overtake, so there we go. Citroen Picasso, goodbye. That's in the blink of an eye, and that's where electric cars really, really come into their own, that instant shove. So we've got 204 horsepower. It will do 0 to 60 in 7.3, and I think it feels at least as quick as that. So if you're into your driving, this is a great car. It's not even a sporty version. Let's wait till the sporty ones come out, like the Cupra Elborn, which is based on the ID3. So yeah, a good showing on the B roads from the ID3. Okay guys, well sadly my day with the ID3 is now coming to an end and it's been a very, very interesting one. I do need to answer the big question though, should you consider buying an ID3 instead of your next Golf? Well, for most people, the answer is a resounding yes. You get more interior space in a car that's not much bigger. You have a car that handles at least as well as the equivalent Golf. It's got multi-link rear suspension. It's got the weight low down. It hasn't got an engine at the front causing it to understeer. It's a really tidy handle. It's also rear wheel drive though, whether you'll feel that effect in normal driving, I'm not too sure. And it's got a lot of range, enough range for most people. It's not too much of a hardship to plug it in when you get home if you have the ability to do that. So a driveway and a, a proper charger is all you need. And that will give you 200 plus every day just overnight while you're sleeping. Now, yeah, the range goes down a lot when you drive on the motorway. I mean, I was just doing 70 miles an hour. A lot of people do more than that and they will feel the range sink rather quickly, but you've still got a lot to play with. So not many people will be doing like 100 miles to 150 plus a day. So it should be even fine for them. And of course you can charge out and about. They've got um, Volkswagen branded chargers in it, all the Tesco's and so on. So yeah, the range isn't really a problem, even with the relatively poor infrastructure we have at the moment. Price, well, it is roughly about 10,000 pounds more expensive than the equivalent Golf 8, and that's with the government grant. So that's probably the biggest sticking point. And who knows what these cars will do when it comes to used values, because there's no precedent for these. Um, most people will obviously finance them, and that will be fine, because they don't have to worry about depreciation. Plus Volkswagen guarantees, I think it's 70% of the battery for eight years. So if it goes below um, the range goes below a couple of hundred, say, you will get a new battery from Volkswagen. So that should give you a lot of peace of mind. Would I buy one? Um, I don't know. I just like the ability to put fuel in my car and drive as far as I want. I've had anxiety today from all my batteries and I'm actually using this cable for the first time in recent videos because my radio mic has run out of juice. So maybe I'll give it a little bit longer, but for most people, this will be an amazing car and I'm really proud that Volkswagen have been able to bring it to market. Okay guys, well, I hope you've enjoyed this very special Volks Wizard video. If you have, please give it a thumbs up, please comment, please share, please, please do subscribe, and I'll see you for the next one very soon. So, once more, turn in. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. You can tell we're on eco tyres, but inherently the chassis feels pretty spot on.